Thank you. We're uh, truly impressed to see the where's turnout the, for where's, this. Where's the clicker? Yep. Uh, there's a lot of people here, which is a very good thing. Uh, um, so, Alex, you wanted uh, to, to kind of take a, a, a straw poll, so to speak, of how many people watch futures in this room, if you could raise your hands, who at least looks at a quote board on a daily basis. Yeah, keep, keep them up. And how many people actually actively trade futures? Keep your hands up. I mean, so that, that's the idea is, is everybody looks at futures every day. It, it impacts how they buy, it impacts how they sell, but yet not everybody uses futures. And, and I think there's a lot of reasons why, and I think everybody has their own reason. But I think the idea is, is just education wins, and I think part of it is just mis misunderstanding the contract. So, yeah, thank we're, you. We're here to shed hopefully some uh, light in addition to Tom and Allison, uh, and then we will have a Q&A session afterwards because I'm sure there's a million questions. Yeah, perfect. But change is happening. I know a lot of people don't necessarily like change in this industry. As of May 15th, Legacy May is gone. It's sunset, it's no longer here. Truck-based contract is the only game in town. So if you're going to look at futures, you're going to trade futures, it's going to be the truck-based futures. Perfect. Uh, legally, an attorney wrote this. We're required to uh, put this on the screen. I'm not going to read all the words on it, but uh, it's just to say that we have it up there. Um, Tom and um, Allison briefly spoke on this. Uh, we thought it's important to put up here. Um, this is just the, the contract, right? So they referenced that the old contract was 110,000 board feet. The new contract is 27.5. Um, you know, 50, so another big difference compared to the old contract was the tick size was 10 cents on the legacy rail car contract. Now the tick size is 50 cents. Uh, so when you go in and, and that's, that's a big difference. Um, and then the other one is the daily price limit. It's a 10% band. Uh, the old contract, it basically reset prices twice a year. Uh, you did it in May and November, and it was a look back. Uh, and so whenever we were $1,000 lumber, we were looking back at, you know, when lumber was $700, we locked limit up, limit down quite a bit. Uh, so this 10% every day, you know, it's going to be 10%. And so we, I don't think we've locked limit up yet. Uh, so this 10% move is actually efficient, and it's really good for the lumber and, and the perfect case in point, the example yesterday, legacy May futures were lock limit down. They settled limit down. The mini contract never traded that 10% threshold. So there was liquidity the entire day when that legacy contract had a pool was not trading. You had the ability to do something in mini May, mini July. And, and so that's the big uh, idea of that 10% threshold is that it allows the market to float to the notional value of the underlying contract. And then the contract months, you know, F is for January, H is for March, K is for May. I, I don't know how we came up with those, those months uh, letters, but uh, that's what it is. Um, and this is a deliverable contract, and we have another slide about this. One thing I want to point out is, and since 2013, I think there's only been six deliveries. So everybody talks about how we're going to go into delivery, it's going to be a big, messy deal. It never gets there, and part of that's because of an EFP, but just because you're buying and selling a lumber contract, most of the time it's just a stopgap. It's a financial tool. You're still gonna go to your normal customer to buy the lumber, to sell the lumber. So the reality is it's just, it's just a tool. Don't get caught up in if I buy a contract, I'm gonna get physical lumber. That's not the idea. Yeah, anybody that's buying something to EFP in exchange for physical or would actually go through the delivery mechanism, it would have to be highly advantageous for you to go that route. There would be a very specific reason you would take delivery or make delivery. For 97% of the people here, you're never gonna have to worry about that. For the other 3%, realistically, you, you might be EFPing. It's a financial stopgap tool. It's, it's, it's to lock in something against physical cash till you get to that point in time where you need to buy or sell that physical cash. I think so we're going to kind of dive into who uses futures, how do you develop a risk management program, who are some people on the hedge committee that should be involved internally, and we'll go over a few charts. Um, Greg, you want to? Yeah, so obviously Montreal Wood Convention, the vast majority of people here are considered commercials. These are people that have a vested interest in trading lumber futures against physical cash. Uh, some of the other people that participate, 
Uh, and I think the, 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 the big growth segment over the last two years of, as you've had the transfer of risk coming out of kind of the, the start of the pandemic, $250 lumber up to $1,700 lumber and everything in between, you've seen the ultimate transfer of risk into single family and multifamily builders, private equity. Um, so that's a big segment now. And with the online, the onboarding of the truck-based contract, it's, it's become much more tangible. Not everybody buys or sells by the card load. I think there's a huge swath of this industry that does it on a truckload basis. So that's the big advantage of the truck contract. It allows people to more fine tune from a risk management standpoint because they're buying and selling trucks. Uh, obviously, the 800-pound gorilla at times are the commodity funds. Um, commodity funds typically are momentum traders. They don't necessarily have a vested interest in trading lumber. It could be chart-based. Uh, as of late, we think that a lot of the commodity funds that have been trading have been triggered off of the two-year note and the 30-year mortgage rate and just kind of the ebb and flow of rates coming up and down based upon what the Fed has been doing. Uh, and then the last segment there is algos. Algos typically are trying to capture the spread between the bid ask. At the end of the day, they're typically out of their positions and they reset. And so the unique thing, uh, uh, and I think Tom and Allison kind of alluded to this, as you build up the new truck-based contract, you bring in new layers of participants in this market, both speculative and industry-wise from other species. Again, that home builder multifamily segment is growing. And then within the CME, there are designated market makers. There are other commodity funds that will baseline this over the next three, six months, the next year. And as you reach new thresholds in open interest and volume, you are going to see an inflow of people that want to trade this. Again, both industry, or that's the hope anyway, but speculatively, and just so everybody's aware, speculation's not a bad thing. Speculation, speculators add liquidity to a market. Now, if you're on the wrong side of that, you might disagree, but they add liquidity, they bring in that bid ask. So that's a very good thing, and I think our expectation uh, is that over the next 12 to 18 months, you organically see not only the four to one or the one to four from the legacy into the mini contract, but we see with this organic growth, open interest get in that 15,000 to 20,000 threshold. Yeah, I think, you know, right now there's 1136 and left in the, the May legacy. You know, realistically, if you can get, you know, a thousand of those to go over, that's 4,000 OI, you're around 8,000 open interest in the new contract. And if we look at the legacy contract the last couple of years, I think, Open interest got up to 37, 3,800. The low end was 1,500. So the old contract, as far as liquidity went, it, we needed a change. And uh, so the CME obviously listened. They talked to industry participants, and they came up with this basically stock split. You know, they, they cut the contract in a fourth, and uh, they also included other species to deliver. You know, we. We've all been talking about BC, the fiber baskets. You know, you're losing less supply out of BC. We needed to be more inclusive as far as who could actually use the contract. And so it's delivered Chicago. Uh, again, you know, 99% of the time, you're not going to go to delivery. So people are like, well, I don't, you know, I don't know how I'm going to trade a contract when it's Doug Fur, it's no longer Western SPF. The reality is, is if that price makes sense for you, if you're doing a forward price job and you can go lock it in six months out, eight months out, you're probably not going to do that in a cash market. It's just a different commodity compared to other markets. So one way you can protect your price is by buying the futures contract. Vice versa, if you're on the sell side, you're not going to go and you know, lock a uh, $1,000 lumber for a year out, right? But you can go to the board and lock that price. And the idea is not to deliver. Everybody gets caught up in, hey, we're going to go to delivery. That's not the idea. Yeah, and I, just in kind of, you know, Euro wood producers, uh, domestic U.S. inland producers, coastal producers, I see a lot of fa familiar faces in this room. This contract was tweaked for you. So Eastern producers, this contract's for you. Domestic U.S. producers, this contract is for you. We've had people that have done correlation in southern yellow pine, this is potentially for you. So, so it's, it's more inclusionary. Inclusionary builds interest. It builds open interest. It builds volume. The existing contract, the legacy contract, was not inclusionary. And, and so this is designed for a, a bigger swath of the industry. And that's our hope that more people use it 
because it's more, uh, uh, it's designed to be used by more people right now, pure and simple. Yeah, I mean, in the past, it, you know, the old contract, you had to be a Western sawmill. They were the only ones that could deliver or they could deliver on your behalf. Now, if you're an Eastern sawmill and, you know, it meets the two by four, number two and better and the tally, you can deliver in the contract. Doug for him for. So, Technically, it doesn't go to delivery, but some people have that peace of mind that, hey, worst comes to worst, the buy side backs out. What are we going to do? We're going to get squeezed by the funds. You can technically deliver it. And the one thing I want to bring up, too, is, is that uh, I hear this all the time. Trading futures is risky. Okay, if you're a doctor or a dentist and you just want to buy it because you think it's a good price or you sell it because it's a high price, that's risky. A commercial hedge program should enhance your margins. It should complement what you do. And if it's done properly, it reduces your risk. Yeah, it goes up and down sometimes. It doesn't make sense. But at the end of the day, you, we do see convergence. When that spot month occurs, so spot month it will happen May 1st, there's no daily limits. Typically, the funds are out in spot month. It's just commercial participants and a few cowboys. Convergence con uh, actually takes place. So as long as you're patient and disciplined and know why you're doing it and everybody's on board, you know, it's not going to be an issue. Convergence will take place. This is uh, reasons to use lumber features as a risk management tool. Greg, you want to? Yeah, no, I, I think the big one is that uh, we've all come out of the last two and a half years with unrealistic expectations. I mean, historically, prior to the pandemic, lumber traded in a $70 to $120 uh, $20 price range. Uh, that increased substantially, $300, $500, $700, $1,000. Um, and I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but over the last two, two and a half years, the number one volatile commodity is lumber. So again, not using futures as a risk management tool. You speculate every day in physical cash, and not only are you trading physical cash, you're trading the most volatile commodity in North America over the last two years. So as we get a reversion back to mean type trading, pre-pandemic type trading, again, do we fall back into the $70 to $120 price band? Realistically, that's probably a more reasonable expect, uh, expectation. So this is all the more reason why futures should complement your physical cash business. This gives you the ability, specifically against your competition, to increase your margins. You, you, you've gone back to running a supermarket now, so how do you increase margins? You're probably not gonna go back to the last two years, you're not gonna have technology type returns, but this is something that should take risk off the table, it should fix profitability, it should increase your market share without increasing the risk. Pure and simple, if it's done correctly, it's not magnifying risk. I think that's a major misconception. It's taking that risk off the table and fixing profitability. Yeah, the other thing, like, so margin requirements, it's not a cost, it's a performance bond, and basically that's how the CME can guarantee every trade. Uh, if you think about it, if you're going to go buy a rail car or lumber, you have 100% cash outlay. You have to go, hey, pay the sawmill who you're buying it from. Here it is. With the CME, it's just $5,500 for a rail car lumber. It's $1,500 for a truck. So with money's not free anymore, money's not cheap, hey, I can't go buy all this cash outlay and go buy all these cars for this job. Well, you can go buy futures, and you're not going to have that much cash outlay. So it's one thing. I think you can look at it in multiple lenses. Uh, but the reality is, is you know, the margin requirements, people get caught up, well, hey, I only want to use futures if I make money in my futures. The reality is, is it's a basis trade. And you know, if you're losing money in your futures, you're making money in your cash. They complement each other. Yeah, so, and, and I think to uh, kind of build on that, Alex, I think you know, the big one here is this is an idea of a secondary customer base. This is not designed to replace your traditional customer base. We're not asking you to deviate from how you trade cash, the relationships you have. You have to look at futures if you're a sawmill, Futures is another customer. If you're a buyer, CME Futures is another sawmill. And it's that idea of laying off risk using this as a financial stopgap uh, in running your business. This should complement your business. This is the secondary customer base that's not going to be used all the time. But when the anomalies develop, and hey, I'd like to be buying at this price. I can't do it in physical cash. Can I do it in futures? I'd like to be selling at this price. I can't do it in my physical cash market, as we all know. 
today, it's very difficult to get any price appreciation in physical cash. So why does futures have this massive premium? Is there something I can do to take advantage of this in lieu of doing something in cash or I can't do in cash? Can I do something in futures? And I think that's the critical thing. This should complement your underlying business. Uh, the other part, so characteristics of a successful risk management program, uh, I think the big thing is just getting a hedge committee in place. So just a tr one lumber trader that's going and trading futures, that's not going to be successful. You have to have the finance team involved. You know, the CFO, treasury controller, they need to understand that margin calls are not a bad thing. You know, the reality is if you own the cash, sometimes it sits there. You don't know if you're right or wrong, but in futures, every day you get a daily statement. Every day you're going to know how right or how wrong you are on your daily statement. Um, and so sometimes, you know, margin calls just have a big misconception. So if you have the finance team on there, uh, that actually, that helps. Um, I think they're, you know, having uh, rules in place, you know, hey, this is how far we want to go out. This is how much we want to hedge. You know, having those conversations, we only want to hedge, you know, our top five items. We have basis uh, data that we, that we look at. Um, yeah, no, I think the biggest uh, uh, issue people have is the, is the financial reconciliation of how do I account for futures on my books. And you have to look at it as it's a four-sided transaction. You have the buying and selling of physical cash. You've got the buying or selling of futures. You take the combination of those four transactions. So buy side, sell side of cash, buy side, sell side of futures, and you have to have the ability to account for it financially, and you might have to do it on different financial statements. You might do it, at, you know, the cash side hits on Q3, the futures is on the books in Q2, so you have to have a CFO, a controller in place, somebody in accounting that can mesh the two sides together. And I think, it, it, you know, when you build out a program, that's the critical part, and once you do that, I think it's pretty, and I think there are enough people in here that use it uh, that can attest to the fact that once you figure that out, it's just as easy as trading uh, uh, the cash. Yeah, and I think, I know this sounds bad, but usually when we get uh, basis trades on, I usually hope that the first trade they do, they lose in futures. Because if they lose in futures and they understand that they made it up in cash, then they understand hedging. You know, and uh, the other thing is, is um, lost my train of thought. Um, uh, just, just to follow up what the idea of a basis trade, and all basis is, and I think we have a slide uh, that talks about a basis is always just defined as cash minus futures, cash minus futures. You can have negative basis, positive basis, but if you're putting on a basis trade and you have a preconceived notion that my cash has to go up, futures has to go down, that's not a basis trade, that's a speculative trade. All we care about with basis, the difference between cash and futures, is the convergence of that basis. You're trying to capture the convergence in basis. If you have a preconceived notion, I'm only going to put this on if future sells off, you know, the bottom, are you speculating or hedging? Speculation is fine, but just define it as such. And I think that's the other big issue people have that... We want to hedge as long as we make money. Futures can be viewed as a profit center, but a true risk management program, it's the combination of physical cash and futures meshed together that gives the net result of the trade. And what I was going to say is, is a lot of times I see people, it starts off as a hedge. The intentions were good. Then they say, hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I think I'm going to go sell my cash, but I'm going to keep my short position on because I think it's going to go lower. That's speculating. So it started off as a hedge, and then it goes into speculation, right? Hey, and people want to spec it. So the idea is, as soon as you buy or sell that physical lumber, you should call Greg and I up, or your broker, and lift your hedge. That's a true hedge. Don't go to lunch. Call us up, because the market lumber can move in one minute. It can go limit up, limit down. So you have to call your broker. That's a true hedge. You don't just lift the cash and say, hey... I'm just going to gamble for a few days. Oh, we lost money. Now hedging doesn't work. Hedging didn't work because you chose to speculate. And so that rolls back crystal clear directive from the decision makers. Who's making trading decisions and define what you're doing up front. Okay. We put this on for this specific reason. I think it, it helps to have it defined up front, whether it's verbally or it's written internally. What is the objective of that trade? What are the risk parameters? What are my expectations? Why did I do it? And be honest with yourself and stick to what, what those parameters are. 
And I think uh, you know, you, 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 you're going to be a lot more successful if you can define whether you're speculation, spe it's speculating or hedging. But again, a true hedge, you don't know where you're going to make or lose the money. It's the combination of the two between cash and futures. Yeah, and you don't care if it's in cash or futures as long as they come together. The other thing that Greg and I do too is we'll do a cash outlay. So, hey, you want to hedge 100 trucks? We want to hedge it at this price. If the market goes up two, three hundred dollars, how much cash is that going to be? So we kind of define, hey, how much money might we, we might need in this program? And so as long as you go through all that stuff, every, everything's kind of all the scenarios have been processed. I think you'll be more successful. Risk management 101. Uh, again, ask yourself where your risk is. I think the big thing the industry does is, is they want to assume someone else's risk, but you need to ask yourself where is my risk. And you know, hedging might make sense for somebody, and then the same you know, different customer might say, hey, it doesn't make sense, and that's okay. That's how you create price discovery. Uh, so assume your own risk, don't assume someone else's risk. And I think we see that in a downtrending market that we're in right now, where you assume the risk for me, I'll be more than happy to pay you when I need the wood, but you take the risk on for me, uh, uh, and when I need it, I'll, I'll, I, I, you got to have it to me tomorrow, but, but that's the big, you know, where is your risk? And I think, you know, like Alex said, we have a, a very bad habit of assuming other people's risk. So that's the clear directive. If you're going to use this as a risk management tool, define your risk and what you're trying to accomplish to do something about that risk. And there's more... Um I think a good way we look at it, it's just another tool in the toolbox, right? Hey, like right now is a good example in the cash market. Okay, hey, the cash market's trading 350, 360, probably not a ton of volume. You can go sell futures. It was at 430 two days ago. Now it's at, you know, 395. So it's still carrying a premium. So you need to look at, hey, if I can't move that physical lumber, although I'm not, you know, I don't think cash is going to go lower, I don't, I don't think I have any downside risk. Okay, maybe future or cash appreciates 15 bucks. That's a good trade. Well, if, what if you hedge and then you make you know, 30 bucks on your future position? Now you made $45. So you need to look at, hey, where, where's my best return? Um, and use futures as a tool. Yeah, and I think that's the idea of that secondary customer base where if you define the risk up front, sometimes there's nothing to do in futures. I know a lot of people like to trade to trade. Sometimes from a true risk management perspective, there's nothing to do today. You, you don't have that discount. You don't have the premium. Again, that's the idea of that secondary customer base. This is what I'm doing today in cash. Can I do something to define risk or take profitability and, and take, it all, you know, take the risk out of that off the table? And it either works or it doesn't. And not every day you're going to have something to do in futures, and that's okay. So there's two, two types of hedges that we typically look at. Uh, one's an inventory or a reload hedge. So what does that mean? It means you own that physical lumber. And the only way you make money in traditional cash market is the prices appreciate. Um, you know, if it goes lower, then you're losing money. So how do you hedge if you're an inventory? If you own that physical lumber, you sell futures. Okay, the difference between that cash where you own it and where you sell it is basis. And, and we track that spread basis. And then the second one that we look at is forward price protection. So if you're a jobber or you know, you're committing to a multifamily project, you know that, hey, you're going to build this job. They want a fixed price. You sell that job at this price. You know, how do you protect that? You have to go buy that lumber at some point. So for a forward hedge, you would go buy futures. Those are the two typical inventory reload and then forward price. Yeah, no. All good, Alex. Potential issues in developing a risk management program. Again, we touched on it, just not having a finance or everybody on board. If you're making margin calls, you know, hey, the worst thing you should do is, okay, hey, you sell the board, hey, we're losing money in features, get out, and then the next day it crashes, and then now you're losing your cash too. So making sure that uh, everybody's on board. Yeah, and the one thing I want to uh, stress again with the idea of a margin call or a performance bond, you go buy physical cash, 100% cash outlay. It's yours until you sell it. Uh, with futures, it's the idea of that performance bond. It's typically around 8 to 10% of the notional value. 
Uh, and I think the big thing, especially with interest rates coming up off the mat and kind of floating back to there is a cost of money. So you have a 100% cash outlay, you own something lock, stock, and barrel. With futures, the idea of using the leverage of margin to buy or sell something. Uh, and then they also the idea of the cost of money. You know, 100% cash outlay, are you using a line of credit? Are you prime plus? There's a cash outlay. There's a cost to borrow money now. So I think that needs to be taken into consideration as well. Yeah. If, one thing that uh, I want to bring up is back month liquidity. So typically, the lumber contracts traded in the front two months. And people are like, well, I, I want to go buy you know, 2024, et cetera. Well, you can buy that front month and then roll it to the next month. So most of your vault, even though you're committing out to a year, you can, you can still you buy the front month contract and then you roll it as expiration comes up or any time that that spread is favorable. So just because the month does not exist, you can still buy the front month. So I think back month uh, illiquidity is sometimes a struggle in this market. What do we got? We got... <laughs> you want to touch on delivery, Gregory? Yeah, and stress? again, the idea of we stress this less than 1%. Uh, I think since 2005, I've been doing this since 1998, since 2005, I think I've done three legacy car deliveries. Uh, everything else is EFP'd in exchange for physical, we'll cover that. So I know we like to fixate on the delivery mechanism, but anybody that's going to make or take delivery through the CME, through their delivery process, it's going to be advantageous. There's going to be a reason that's beneficial to you to do that. The reality is it's not going to happen. So, I mean, it's a deliverable contract. I think that keeps everybody honest. The idea that you could take or make physical delivery of this. But the reality, again, can't stress this enough. This is a stop financial stopgap tool for 97% of the people in this room. We're... Uh we're gonna, we got four, a couple minutes left, and then we got to take questions. So we're going to go through some of these slides uh, quickly. This is just, a, I think I'm a visual person, so looking at this, it helps me. If you can look, this is a histogram over the last 10 years. So you can see that majority of the trading is between that, uh, what, less than, it's 300 to 500. Um, the last 10 years, you know, obviously the last two years kind of disrupted that chart. But let's look at, at uh, this is just a more a different chart, same information as that last chart. This is a, the last two year histogram. So you can see there's been a very big difference because of what happened the last two years. So again, the industry is having to rationalize reversion back to mean type pricing. We thought we would reset at higher numbers. The reality is we probably will ultimately reset at higher numbers, but it's a feeling out process where I think everybody here is trying to rationalize where the last two years a dream, what does it hold future, you know, going into the future, and it's that reversion and, and that kind of added, is added to the volatility uh, as lumber kind of evolves back to what it once was. Yeah. And uh, I think we're going to open up to questions. Is there any, anything you want to cover, Greg? No, I think I know uh, uh, Tom, Alice, uh, uh, Tom and Allison are here. Does anybody have any? There's, please ask questions. Uh, if we don't know the answer, we'll get you the answer. Thanks. We could. Thank you. Allison and Tom, do you want to come back? Thank you, Alex and Greg, Thanks. for the presentation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so questions from the floor here. And I have my cell phone to check. If you have online, please feel free to send us your comments or questions online too, please. Don't be shy. We have 50. Yeah. Oh, my God. Sven, is that on the... No. <laughs> hey, good, uh, great, great information, guys. Um, Would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Kyle Little. I'm from Sherwood Lumber. Um, we are heavy participants in using these tools. And I think there's just a lot of, I don't want to say misinformation, but misunderstanding of how the risk management opportunities that exist in trading these, uh, uh, using these uh, derivatives. Um, in doing so, I just wanted to ask about specifically EFP. I think there's just a mystery around that. Can you explain to the group um, who delivers or who can deliver, who can receive, and what products that you can actually exchange for physical? 
Yeah, so we have a slide here, but obviously we didn't get to it. But EFP, uh, it's just another tool in the toolbox where if you're a sawmill, you like the price, you can just go sell the board, and it's just another marketing tool, another channel to actually move the product. Uh, as it is now, you have to be, it has to be sitting at a sawmill. So if, if you're within that, it doesn't have to be sitting at a sawmill. I promise Kyle, am I, is my mic on? I promise Kyle's not a plant, but I did want to clear this up. So thank you, Kyle. Anybody can EFP. You do not have to be a mill to be the sell side of an EFP. You have to have physical to exchange for physical. You don't even have to have an existing position. You can take on a position for an EFP, but it is open to anybody. Any two counterparties can engage together in an EFP. And so the other thing I want to just clarify, exchange for physical, there's the physical cash side of this transaction, there's the future side, the buy side, sell side, so you're long futures, somebody is short futures, you offset at a strike in exchange for uh, the physical, a strike price, a designated price, there has to be an exchange of physical cash on the other side. So there's the offsetting of a futures transaction, there's the exchange of physical cash at that same strike price, but you have to exchange the physical cash and you have to have proof that cash was transacted on the other side of this transaction. Yeah, and thanks for bringing that up. So other markets, grain markets, typically you have the um, co-ops EFPing with the uh, merchandisers. It's not the, the farmers EFPing. And so technically in this market, if you're a wholesaler, you can EFP with whoever. As long as each customer has a futures account, you can actually EFP. Lumber just traditionally, it's typically the EFPs come from the sawmill, but you don't have to be, you can buy you know, a uh, rail car of lumber or a truck of lumber, and then hey, my customer has a futures account, let's do an EFP. Yeah, and I think the other important thing to stress is that if you are going to go through the delivery process, you have to have four trucks. If you're going to EFP, you don't have to EFP four trucks or a, 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 a rail car. You can EFP one truck. Yep. Additionally, while the contract is still trading, you, can, you don't have to EFP one of the deliverable species. Yep. You don't have to EFP two by four. So it is negotiated between the two counterparties at whatever premium or discount. So it does not have to be the exchange specified species, quality spec, tally, et cetera. It is, it's a way to, exactly what it says, exchange physical, whatever the buyer and seller mutually agree on, sort of on exchange. And so to give an example of that, everybody thinks of Western SPF. That's the uh, uh, dominant EFP species, but we've EFP'd Great Eastern Great Lakes, we've EFP'd Bo Eastern Boston, Euro, uh, domestic hemp fur, and Southern Yellow Pine trucks. So, so, I mean, it, you, you can run the gamut of, if you're going to go through the delivery process post expiration, then it becomes contract defined per contract specifications. But up until that time, and so the other misconception with an EFP is that I have to wait until I get into the spot month. No, you can EFP at any time. It doesn't have to be a spot month that is EFP'd. So the spot month or the, the front month contract is May. I could EFP July today. I could EFP September. As long as the buyer, so you have a known counterparty on each side, as long as the buy side and sell side agree on the species, the price, so you're gonna negotiate just like you normally would. This is my adder, this is my deductor from a delivery standpoint, this is my adder deductor from a species standpoint, an item standpoint, you're gonna negotiate that like you traditionally would, and then on the, you're going to exchange the cash with the offsetting transaction of offsetting the futures. All right, that's a good question. You had a, yeah. all the sensors from everyone, thank you. Other questions? Yes, completely on the left. Long throw. Yeah, yeah, let's have fun. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, my name's Adam DiBiazio uh, from United Lumber Home Hardware. We operate a few small chain of lumber yards where we sell to the builder. And I've been waiting for a tool like this that we can use at our, uh, at our company. How do we go about getting into doing all this? Like what's step Question. one to 
get into A, to be able to trade it, to speculate it, and also hedging? Good question. So there's a, you have to fill out an account uh, paperwork, which is like a 58-page application. And so typically, they don't want just somebody trading you know, any commodity or any futures. It's not very difficult, but there's, there's basically a link. It's DocuSign. They go through the application. They'll probably ask for you know, articles of formation. You know, are you a real company? Financials. And so it's just a link that we can send out. But it's, a, it's an account paperwork that you have to fill out and get onboarded.